trust me, I'm going to try to be as sweet as I can be tonight. I don't want to offend anybody. But I have no problem with my next statement. If this book offends you, you'll just have to be offended. I'm going to stick with the book. Now, I don't, I don't want to come across as condescending. I don't want to come across as mean or nasty or hateful. I can be all those things. But I don't want to come across that tonight. Uh, the Lord knows my heart. My heart is full of love tonight. I, I'm appreciative of the message. Uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at this message, uh, contemplating on this message. Uh, I know this isn't an easy message to receive, but it's a needed message to receive. And this is why we don't have revival. This is why we don't see great movements of God, because we don't let him be Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 11. And no, Brother Thad, that was not the introduction. Verse number 11 of chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. The Bible says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Look, chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the new congregational song we sang tonight. Lord, that blessed my heart. You deserve the best because, God, who are we that you would bleed and die for? You deserve our best in every facet of our lives, and God forgive us of the many times we do not consider you, we do not behold, we do not give you the first fruits of our lives. And we do not give you the praise that you deserve. And God, we certainly fall short of your glory every day. Now, Father, you know my heart. Lord, I want to be a, a vessel of the Lord. I want to be a conduit of the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, you're the one who has called me and placed me in this position. And Lord, I want to be your mouthpiece tonight. Lord, help me to have the right spirit. Help me to say everything you'd have me to say. Lord, help me not to say anything contrary to the word or will of God. Lord, I know these people and many of these folks, Lord, will receive the word of God with gladness. And God, we are thankful for that. Those that, Lord, will struggle with some of the things they will hear tonight, I pray you would help them. I, would help, I pray that you would help them to see it not as an admonition, but as a learning experience that, God, they might truly walk in fellowship with thee and put thee first in, your li in their lives. Now, Father, I pray that you'd speak to every heart. Show us, Lord, uh, our good points and our strengths, but also show us our weaknesses. And God, reveal unto us what it will take to be found uh, perfecting holiness for fear of the Lord in our lives. Now, Lord, bless as only you can. Use this unworthy vessel. Help us to glean and learn from the Word of God tonight. We'll bless you and praise you for it. Father, be with those that are sick. Be with those that are struggling, those who are recovering from surgeries. God, have your way upon every need, and we'll thank you for it. For it's in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. In these verses, we find Paul revealing something to the local church at Corinth. Uh, why anybody would ever call themselves Corinthian Baptist Church, I will never know. This was a very 
uh, corrupted church. It was a very carnal church. They had a lot of problems in this church. And uh, in the letters written to this church, Paul was admonishing them. He was having to straighten them out time and time again. And why you'd want to be associated with that, I don't know. But in this day and age, it's relevant. Many of them should be called that. Um, but in these verses, just as uh, Thad's way of introduction, uh, I want you to notice something about the believers at the church of Corinth. Uh, can I say they had a heart problem? In verses 11 through 13, Paul said, My heart's enlarged for you, but you're not being straight with me. And their heart was narrow towards Paul and narrow towards the things of God. He spoke to them as uh, children and said, uh, Be ye enlarged. Uh, open your heart to the things of God. There's nothing worse for a man of God to stand and proclaim God's word uh, to folks that are narrow-minded and will not open their heart to the truth. Uh, there are a lot of folks, every time they come to church, they've already made up their mind uh, whether or not they're going to be obedient to God. Well, uh, uh, if Brother Doug preaches on this, I'm not going to pay attention. I'm going to fold my arms. Uh, I'm not going to listen. Uh, he's not going to move me today. Well, Brother Doug's not trying to move you. The Spirit of God is. And a lot of folks, uh, they make up their mind. I'm not going to get right with God. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And there's some sense of rebellion in some people. They know that people are praying for them. They know that others want to see them get right with God, and they won't get right with God just out of spite. That's his crowd at Corinth. They had a heart problem. Can I say they also had a home problem? Verses 14 through 16, he deals with uh, 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 not being unequally yoked together, and he goes on to give several descriptions to them uh, 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 that, uh, that what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. Uh, communion, uh, what communion does light have with darkness? Uh, what concord with Christ with, with Belial, the devil? Uh, or what part hath he that believeth in the infidel? Uh, they had a home problem because they were marrying outside the faith, uh, and it, it brought nothing but problems to them. Hmm? Uh, all my life, I've heard it preached and preached and preached and preached and preached. You better not get your mate who's not saved. You'll have nothing but problems. But somewhere in these little pea brain minds of us when we're teenagers, some of these people, they just think, well, I know what will happen. They'll fall in love with me and they'll start going to church and they'll get saved. But 99.9% .9 of the time, the opposite happens. The one that's not saved drags the one that is saved out of church. Your home will never be whole when you're not in agreement. Mm -mm. Can you make it as a couple? Sure. You can have cohabitation. But there's never going to be true understanding. There's always going to be compromise along the line. It's a dangerous, dangerous thing. Young people, listen to me. The best way to get a mate is to get a hold of God and pray and say, God, you send me one. And quit worrying about what they look like and, you know, what you're tasting. Just let God send you one because God's made one for you. And when He sends you one, it'll be the right one. They had a real problem. I could spend a lot of time right here on being unequally yoked, but I'm not going to. There's a lot of folks that marrying unbelievers. A lot of folks marrying outside their race. Problems with that. I don't care who it is, you're never going to be accepted by everybody. There's problems with that. If we had time, we'd go over to Ezra, and I could show you where it's unbiblical. But people don't like that. They don't want to receive the Word of God. People think they know better than God. You don't. Mm. They had a home problem. They had a heart problem. Can I say this? They had a holiness problem. Verses 17 down to chapter 1, verse 1. They weren't living holy. Can I say the Bible still says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's what the Bible says. 
Nowhere in the Bible does it say, in 2021, just do the best you can and don't worry about it. Just come as you are and don't worry about it. The measuring stick for being right with God is not measuring your life to somebody else. It is measuring your life to Christ. He's the yardstick. We ought to desire to be holy. Tonight we will be teaching, where it says verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I'll teach or preach whatever this thing is on Baptist distinctives tonight on separation and sanctification. On separation and sanctification. There's been a lot of teachings on this uh, that is not biblical. There's a lot of teachings on it that is skewed. There's a lot of teachings on it that is misunderstood. And tonight we want to uh, certainly help you to understand separation and sanctification. Uh, let me just say this, that the Scriptures are what separates us. And it's the Spirit of God that sanctifies us. There are people that say, well, I'm trying to get sanctified. You never can. That's a spiritual work. But you can separate yourself. And so, let's begin with the topic of separation. Biblical separation is the practice of separating from sin and error unto truth and righteousness. We separate from the world, but we are sanctified to God. Again, the separation part is we practice separating from sin and error unto truth and righteousness. For him to know it to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So we long to strive to do what's right in the eyes of God. We long to the best of our abilities to forsake things that displease God and long for things that please God. We are separating ourselves from the world to Almighty God. Now, there's three types of separation. There's moral separation. Moral separation is separating from sin and worldliness. There are some things that should never be named in the life of a Christian. We ought to separate from immoral things. Separate from sinful things. Uh, the Lord gave us the, the Word of God to show us what was sin? The law was given as our schoolmaster that we might be brought to the knowledge of sin. By the way, if God said, Thou shalt not, you don't. If He says, Thou shalt, you better. Very simple. People say, I can't understand that archaic language of the Bible. Well, no means no, and yes means yes. It's not real tough. You know, and by the way... And God didn't repeat everything in the New Testament that he said in the Old Testament because, you know, something you want is good enough. A lot of things he didn't have to repeat again. And just because we live under grace doesn't mean the law was done away with. The penalty of the law was done away in Christ, but there are still some things that are still upheld from the Old Testament. Um, Brother Phil, in the Old Testament... Uh, it was very prevalent you weren't to marry your sister. Well, God didn't even have to tell us that again in the New Testament. You should understand you didn't need to go to the prom with your sister. You know what I'm saying? But there are some people who say, well, it's not in the New Testament. Show me in the New Testament. Show me in the New Testament. Uh, we're to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. And true Bible believers have enough spiritual understanding to know there are some things just wrong. Uh, and so there's moral separation. There are some things that I just, that are, they're immoral, they're wrong, and I'm not going to do it because the Bible says it's wrong. Then there is doctrinal separation. 
That is separation from those whose teachings and practices are contrary to the Scriptures. Uh, and they're contrary to the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Listen, uh, I'll get to this a little bit more in a moment, uh, but I do not go to the community prayer meetings when they invite every denomination. The Bible makes it very clear. Uh, how can we worship together if we do not believe the same? If they're not using the King James Bible, I'm not going. And I, I do not recognize certain people in their titles because they're religious. Hmm? Uh, I, I recognize the brethren, and the sisters of Christ, and those that are born-again believers that believe the book and believe things right. I don't worship with folks that don't believe the book can't because if they're trampling this book under their feet then they're trampling my savior under because he was the living word hmm? I just don't have any time for him say brother Doug you're narrow minded I am about that narrow right there actually I'm less than that because I got a lot of notes and stuff in here I'm really about that narrow right there uh, uh, there's doctrinal separation and again I'll, I'll go into more detail in a moment but then there's also practical separation and this is where it gets difficult brother Bob practical separation is when we separate from the brethren who've erred from the faith and have refused to repent now don't get me wrong if somebody's erred from the faith we're, we're to try and restore them in a spirit of meekness lest uh, we also be tempted we ought to reach out to them. We ought to be good to them. We ought to try to get them back to the fold. But there are some who are wrong. They know they're wrong. They brought shame and reproach not only on Christ but upon His church. And you bring them before the church and they refuse to get right. Uh, you are to withdraw yourself from them until they do get right. It's never a, a wanted thing never a happy time uh, some of the saddest times in my ministry is when I've had to stand people before the people of God bring charges and accusations before the church against those people who refused to repent could have all been solved because I've already met with them several times I've already discussed the error of their ways already discussed the remedy it's repentance and faith towards God and when they refuse, they refuse and they refuse and I let them know you're going to be brought before the church and they still refuse because of pride. That's a hard thing. I've had to do that. There are some that are sitting here tonight who witness me having to do that and their family members standing up and cussing me in the church for exercising biblical discipline. Now, Jordan was young. Christian was still on a bottle. I dare say nobody's going to stand up and cuss me today with them two big boys in the house. Are you listening? Or if they do, heaven help them. Huh? That's a, that was just a joke. Huh? Trying to lighten the mood here a little bit. I'm not going to mention any names if somebody's about ready to pass out. Eddie Howe. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. So let's talk about separation. As fundamental Bible believing Baptists, we're exhorted to separate ourselves in several areas of our lives. First of all, we are to live a separated life when it, when it comes to our conduct. We're not to live like the world. We carry the name Christian because we say we're Christ-like. Let me ask you a question. Do those around you who don't know Christ think you're Christ-like? Because there's the real test. You go read the book of Acts. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Why? Because they exemplified the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Today, everybody claims to be a Christian. Who calls you a Christian? Well, what should my conduct be, Brother Doug? I'm glad you asked. The pastoral epistles. Paul wrote to Timothy. Paul wrote to Titus. Uh, the letter to the Thessalonians. The letter written to the church at Ephesus. They deal greatly with how we should conduct ourselves. Now, the whole Bible does, but those in particular get really down to where the rubber meets the road. But Titus chapter 2 says this in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We should conduct ourselves soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Ephesians in Ephesians 5 says this, and I'm going to read about seven verses, so hang with me. He says, Be ye followers, verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. Christ showed compassion. Shouldn't we walk in love? Christians shouldn't have a chip on their shoulder. We ought to walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. He teaches us how to conduct ourselves. Our conduct, we should be a, live a separated life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, Support the weak. These are all great things. Be patient toward all men. Boy, that's tough, isn't it? See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Some of you wasn't rejoicing when you come into church tonight. You should have been. You got to come to church tonight. Pray without ceasing. How much have you prayed this week? In everything, give thanks. I've heard Brother Tony say that once. I've heard him say it a thousand times when he testified. Uh, he says, he, he says we've got to give thanks and everything. Even when he has a hard time, he gives thanks to God. Uh, we ought to learn from that. Hmm? He also says this, For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. That means the Holy Ghost tells you to do something, do it. Mind the Lord. Despise not prophesying. That means when the preacher's preaching on heaven, you enjoy it. When he's not, enjoy it. Don't despise it. Receive it. Hmm? Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And here's a good one. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Let me say that one again. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If you have to ask if there's something wrong with it, you need to abstain from it. Because there probably is. Hmm? If it looks like a duck, if it has webbed feet, if it quacks like a duck, if it has feathers, it's a duck. If it looks like the world, sounds like the world, smells like the world, guess what? It's of the world. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If anybody can look at whatever situation it is, and bring shame on you and your testimony, you don't need to be there. It's not always easy, friends. See, we should be separated in our conduct. Then people will know we're Christian. Now, let me throw off on the brethren a little bit here. A lot of independent Baptist preachers have come up with a list of rules 
that you've got to keep that makes you separated? Well, we've got a book of rules. That's the list, not my personal list. Very important. Because what has happened over the years is we've uh, cookie-cuttered, stamped out Christians looking a certain way, sounding a certain way, acting a certain way, and everybody thinks they're holy because they do that. Remember, separation is not sanctification. You can be separated and deader than a doorknob when it comes to spiritual things. Hmm? My reason for separation should be that I want to please God. Not, I want everybody to think I'm holy. There's a difference, because if that's your attitude, you're not separated. You're full of pride. So we need to be separated in our conduct. And I could go on for hours on each one of these, but Thad's already about to pass out, all right? But we must be separated in our conduct. Hmm? I've used this illustration before in the past. I love that old song, Oh, How I Love Jesus. It's a wonderful song. But if you've got a guy who's three sheets to the wind drunk sitting on a bar stool singing, Oh, How I Love Jesus, does his actions back up his words? Your actions speak louder than words. That's why your conduct should be separated. Let me move on. Our conversation should be separated. We shouldn't talk like the world talks. Our speech ought to be different. So preacher, give me chapter and verse for that. I'm glad you asked. Titus chapter 2 verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Verse 8. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Say, preacher, I got mad and let a four letter word slip. You're out of the will of God. They preach you that never happened. You know what the Bible says? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you can drop four-letter words, then your speech can be condemned. It also shows what's in your heart. And let me tell you what's not in your heart. Jesus. Hmm? You know that song Brother James sings? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I've got him on my mind. And the other part, I got him on my heart. He's not on your heart. Thank you, Phil. You say, well, that's only one verse. Well, you understand, in order to be doctrine, you've got to find it two or three times written in the same context, the same people. But let me give you some more context. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I've never heard anybody say a four-letter word that ministered grace to my hearing. Now, here's what's bad, Brother Clint. There's people sitting in here tonight. I've heard them drop four-letter words. I want to tell you something. God's not pleased with that. There was a time when people would hide their sin from the preacher. I've heard them say it right in front of me. So, Brother Bob, don't say I'm a mean preacher because there have been a lot of times since I've heard some people drop some things and I didn't get up and preach on their sin. I figure if the Holy Ghost can't tell them, they're in far more worse trouble than me getting up and preaching on their sin. They may not even know the Holy Ghost, Brother James. You know, because when he saves people, he cleans up their mouth too. I've heard that, 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 that Yahoo Squirrely guy over there say, man, he used to be a foul mouth till God saved him. Haven't you said that? I know. I, I listen. I listen when you talk. Say, so, well, Brother Doug, you're meddling. Well, I'm fixing to meddle some more. James chapter 3, verse number 8 says, But the tongue can no man tame, but the Lord can. 
Just thought I'd throw that in. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. 1 Timothy 4.12 Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Peter 1.15 but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. God be separated in our conversation. Miss Nett's got a rule. Me and the boys don't adhere to it much. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So we wait till she goes out of the room, then we let it go. A Christian got married and moved out of the house. Huh? We ought to be separated in our conversation, our conduct. People ought to know that there's something different about us. The Bible said that we're to be a peculiar people of a royal priesthood. Hmm? There's just something about certain people you expect certain things out of why do you think the queen of england hates these younger generation of royals that have broken all the code of the royal family see the royal families had dirt for years but they've always kept it contained because they want to present themselves in a certain manner well you and i need to get the dirt under the blood of christ and they need to see something different you know why people aren't flocking to our church? They don't see anything different. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking today, all the villages, all the towns, everybody around Horeb knew when God was on the mountain. People ought to know when God's here. Uh, well, since you're about to pass out, let's make you really good now. Can I help you with something else? We're to be separated in our clothing. Thank you, Brother Tony. See, I said something nice about him, you know, his, his testimony, and he's with me now. I just teased him. You know what I love about Brother Tony? He can handle it. There ain't nothing I can say to him he can't handle. He just, he can't, it, it rolls off him like water on a duck's back. He don't care. Tony just don't. I, I love Brother Tony. I was mad at him one time. Went with me on a camp meeting. You know, Mike Massey. We left Sunday night after church. Brother Bob and Miss Sonny was worried because I preached hard that day that I was going to fall asleep going to North Carolina, wherever he was going. So they bribed Brother Tony said, don't let the preacher fall asleep. It's two and a half hours to the Tennessee border. I had to pull off the red rest stop and get out of the van and go rest my ears. He talked my, I'm, I'm, I, I thought they were bleeding. I mean, he didn't shut up the whole time. I thought, I need a break. Well, I didn't find out until I got home. Bob put him up to it. Here, Sonny put him up to it. Now he's like, Lord, this woman you gave me. That wasn't very good conduct right there, Brother Bob. It was true. Uh, so I was mad at Brother Tony. She'd been mad at Miss Sonny. So all them jokes I make about her, she earned them. We need to be separated in our clothing. In Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 6, this is not talking about future tense. It's talking about right now. It says we have been made kings and priests in Christ Jesus. He made us a king to rule and reign over our flesh, he made us a priest so that we don't have to go through anybody else. We can go directly to the Lord Jesus Christ, our intercessor, our mediator, uh, and take our petitions to him. 
You don't have to get a hold of Brother Doug to get a prayer through to heaven. You can just talk to Jesus yourself. And who knows, Brother Doug might be in a bad way and can't get a prayer through, but if you're right with God, you can get a prayer through. But you have been made a king to rule and reign over your flesh and a priest. Now, I'll give you a little history lesson. Under the commandments of God, the high priest, when he'd offer up sacrifice, he had sacrificial robes on. And he would slay the, the throat of the animal, drain the blood from the animal, and when he'd do that, he got blood all over him. Miss Mary, before he could go in the sanctuary, he had to go and wash himself and change his clothes and put on his priestly robes to go into the sanctuary. And he'd go into the sanctuary and he could uh, 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 do the ministering at the table of showbread or, or, or do any other the ministering, uh, uh, the altar incense or whatever the occasion called for. Uh, but if it was the Passover feast and he was to take the blood... Uh, uh, and put it on the mercy seat, he had to have on more than just his priestly robe. Uh, he also had to have on the breastplate of righteousness, uh, had to have his mitre on his head. Uh, he also had to have the urim and the thummim around his neck. Uh, he had to be uh, decked in a certain way, and if he wasn't, the sacrifice wouldn't be accepted, Brother Brian. And not only that, his life was taken from him. You say, well, that was Old Testament. But in the New Testament, you're the priest. And you just can't come in these doors however you want to and God meet with you. Matter of fact, you've got to do business with God before you come in those doors. But you've got to be adorned right when you come in these doors. I know it's popular today to look like a bum and come to church. But we already sang the song... He deserves our best. And your very best, I mean, He gave His best for you. You ought to come in looking your best for Him. And I'll say this, that those that don't want to dress right when they come to church, they got one of two problems. Number one, they want to be the Lord of their life. They want to choose how they're going to do. I'll dress how I want to. I'll, I'll, I'll look however I want to. It's none of the preacher's business. Well, it's not my business, it's God's business. Either they're the Lord of their life, or the Lord is. The second problem they have, they don't know the Lord. They don't respect Him. And this is more than just a place where we come and hang out. This is the place that has been designated where we meet with God. We ought to be clothed right. Hmm? So, preacher, you're just picking on us. Well... The Lord dealt with it in the New Testament too. In 1 Timothy 2, 9, In the like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair, gold, or pearls, or costly ray, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. The Lord basically is saying that women shouldn't come in dressed to attract a man. Thou to come in dress to honor God. Modest apparel. Men, you should as well. When you leave here, people ought to know you ought to have been to church if nothing else by the way you dress. They ought to know that. They ought to know that you met with Jesus by your countenance. But they ought to know you come to meet with him by your clothing I don't know that so brother Doug that offends me I'm sorry you're offended but when we come in not clothed right it offends God hmm? preached a message years ago on casual Christianity carnal Christianity counterfeit Christianity that's a good outline right there somebody give that J.D. Walker he'll preach it You ought to be dressed right. Enough said about that. You ought to be separated in our dress. Hmm? You say, well, this is fashionable. Does it please God? Would Jesus' mother wore it? 
that well in their day they didn't well in, in this day would she wear it Say, brother Doug if you tell Miss Annette what to wear I don't have to tell Miss Annette what to wear but I will tell you this there are times she'll ask me you know when she's looking at something is this dress too short and I'll say nope or yes if I say yes she don't buy it why because she wants to honor her husband she wants to honor the Lord by the way husbands how your wife dresses outside the church that's that's on you you're her head Now, I understand. Let me find somebody. Gordon, you don't have a wife. Let me pick on you. I understand this day and age we've got a bunch of sissies called husbands that won't tell their wife anything. They're scared to death that, you know, she's not going to fix him pinto beans and cornbread or something. You know what a respect, make her respect your husband? In love, be a man. Don't be hateful. Don't be nasty. Be a man. I know it's not popular with Hollywood, but it's okay to be a man. You're the head of your household, or supposed to be. Now, you can't tell her you're the head of your household. Again, you've got to earn that. Be respectful. Let me move on. We also need to be separated in our convictions. What it many times is referred to as standards. There are biblical convictions. That means if the Bible says it, that needs to be your conviction. Then there are personal convictions. That's when you're reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit puts something on your heart that's not in the Bible, but God told you not to do it. But Phil, if God told you to sit on that front row every time you come to church, and you better sit on that front row every time you come to church, but don't hold me up to your personal conviction. Maybe God didn't tell me to sit there on the front row. Hmm? There are personal convictions. I have quite a few. Number one, I don't drink root beer when I go out to a restaurant because now they serve them in a bottle that looks like a beer bottle. Last thing I need is somebody come in and say, look at that preacher over there, got a beer bottle in front of him. They got enough ammunition against me already. I don't need any more. I like root beer. Nothing wrong with root beer. You have root beer with a bottle that looks funny. I really don't care. But my personal conviction is I don't drink root beer out of a bottle. It looks like a beer bottle. I just don't do it. It's one of my convictions. Another one of my convictions. I always put the cart from the shopping cart thing in the cart corral. Always. Nothing gets on me any more than me having to log around, find out a parking spot, finally find one, there's a cart right in the middle of it. I don't know if you noticed, but our vehicles aren't small. We need all of that parking spot. I always put the cart. Why? Because as sure as I don't, the wind's going to pick it up. I'm going to pull off. Somebody's going to see me and know me, see that cart bang into somebody's car, and they're going to go around telling that preacher done messed up somebody's car. There have been times it has been a monsoon, the rain coming down sideways, and I'll still take the cart to the cart corral, and can I help you? Every time it's that way, the cart corral is 40 miles away. If you watch me, most of the time I'm parking close to the cart corral now. That's my personal conviction. Whether or not you do it, I don't really care. That's my personal conviction. I have some other personal convictions. But you ought to have some convictions. You ought to have some things in your life that says, you know what, I don't want anybody to think bad of me. And so I'm just not going to do that. Hmm? I go to the, to the Reds game or Bengals game. I, now, let me qualify. I only go now if I get free tickets. It's much better to sit in my recliner and watch it on TV. Are you listening? But I don't even watch that anymore. But it, when I go to a ball game, if I'm sitting on the end and somebody in the middle wants an alcoholic beverage and the beer vendor you know, comes, I do not pass the beer. They're either going to come and get it or he's going to take it around to them. I don't pass it. So, Brother Doug, that's not being very hospitable. Well, number one, it's not my house where there wouldn't be any alcohol there. Number two, my luck, as soon as I put that thing in my hand, it would be the rapture and I'm going to meet the Lord with beer in my hand. Never drank a beer in my life, and I'm going to meet the Lord with one in my hand. Yeah, right. That ain't happening. 
I don't pass it. Hmm? You know, I can see too if I'd sooner get somebody hit a home run and jump up and throw the thing, and then I got to buy the guy one. I'm, you know, that ain't happening. You ought to have some convictions. You say, preacher, all these things are really hard. No, the Bible says the ways of a transgressor is hard. Jesus said his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Uh, but let me give you some verses that will help you to have some convictions. Galatians 2.20, I love this verse. Anytime somebody asks me to sign their Bible, I always put this verse underneath my signature. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is important in that verse that will help you with separation is this. Not I, but Christ. Put him first. It's not about me. It's about him. Not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Hmm? 1 Corinthians six nineteen. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When God forgave you of your sins and gave you eternal life and gave you a home in heaven, He paid for you. Your life is no longer yours. It's His. And when you get that nailed down, your life will be busy pick up in your life. It really will. Just let him make all the decisions. Let him handle it. Let him take it. It'll all be good. Just know that your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. And by the way, he's in you. Everything you see, he sees. Everything you touch, he touches. Everywhere you go, he goes. Everything you listen to, he listens to. You keep that in the forefront of your mind, and it'll change your conduct. Hmm? I won't read Philippians 2. Five. I quote it a lot. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, uh, who, uh, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to equal, be equal with God. I guess I will read it. But made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, it was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. If Jesus can be obedient to the will of God, you and I can be. Are we not Christ-like? We need to be like him. And then let me say this. I'll get off separation. It gets better in sanctification, I promise you. We need to be separated in our Christianity. I alluded to a minute ago that... We, we can't run with people that aren't our stripe. Why? Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? I cannot worship with somebody who doesn't believe like we believe. I used to get so vexed. And all you Southern Gospel music fans right now, here's where I'm going to tick you off. You just get so vexed you go to these Southern Gospel concerts. And I always, I enjoy it. I love the singing. I love the talent. Most of them aren't right with God. They're not members of local churches. They don't tithe. They're, it's all about they're not good enough to be country and western stars, so they're Southern Gospel stars. I understand that. But I go with the mindset, this is entertainment. You go with that, you're okay. But you get there and they say, okay, let's all worship. I can't worship. You got Pentecostal folks here. You got Methodist folks there. You got some folks down there that don't know anything. You probably even got some Muslims in there. I don't know. Uh, uh, but we don't agree. You got the window washing crowd. You got the brazen your neck crowd. You got all that junk going on in there. Nobody's preaching the Bible. Nobody's proclaiming Jesus as Lord. Uh, they're all showing off their talent. There's no worship in there. I can't agree with that. I quit going to Southern Gospel singings or concerts, whatever you call it, when they started having them down there at the, uh, the, uh, the devil's house down there uh, in, in Covington, the Masonic Temple. I'm not going to anything that's supposed to be Christian in a Masonic Temple. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Hmm? I say, Brother Doug, you're so narrow-minded. You have no idea. You ought to live with me for a while. Me and Archie Bunker, like that. But our Christianity has to be separate. 
I'm not saying there's not people saved in other denominations and other churches. I'm not saying that. But I cannot fellowship with them if we lay aside doctrinal differences. Now, I know people that go to different denominations. They use the right Bible. Fundamentally, on most doctrines we agree on, I could have a conversation. I could spend time with them. But folks that don't believe the book, folks that don't believe in the virgin birth, folks that don't believe in the deity of Christ, folks that don't believe in the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, folks that don't believe uh, uh, that uh, you're saved by faith, by grace through faith, uh, folks that believe you've got to be baptized to be saved, and folks who believe you've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, a second blessing. I can't agree with all that stuff, so it's better for me not to be around it. Because here's the thing. You give them an inch, they take a mile. Hmm? Romans tells us this. There are other folks we in Christianity cannot fellowship with. In Romans 16, verse 17, very sad words in the Bible. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Pretty simple. If somebody comes in here and they start causing problems and divisions in the body of Christ, where to mark them, that means everybody, hey, Brother James is a knucklehead, and then avoid them. Don't extend to them right hand of fellowship. Don't spend any time with them. Don't, just leave them out there on an island. He goes on to say this, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I've seen that happen. I'll leave that alone. Second Thessalonians 3, 6 says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Verse 14 of that same chapter says, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So there are certain things we need to separate from, even folks in our own church that don't do right. Now we're not to treat them like an enemy. We're to hope and pray for them that they get right with the Lord so fellowship can be restored. Uh, so there is separation in Christianity. Let's move on to sanctification. Not near as long, only a couple points in sanctification will be done. Again, separation is... The Bible does that. Jesus said in his earthly ministry, he didn't come to bring peace but a sword. Doctrine divides. Always has, always will. The Bible is what separates us. I've got a nice little book in my office. It says the, ba uh, the Bible makes us Baptist. And the Bible is what divides. Uh, it separates us from some things. But sanctification what the spirit does it sanctifies us towards God now the word sanctification means to be set apart be set apart the spirit of God makes us different than anything in this world hmm? now there are three aspects of sanctification as far as in the life of a believer uh, there's past sanctification the believer is set apart from the power and bondage of sin by the Holy Spirit at the time of salvation. When you got saved, the chains of sin were broken in your life. The bondage of sin was broken in your life. The Holy Spirit separated you unto God. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's past sanctification. There's present sanctification. That's the process in which the Holy Spirit matures us, grows us, teaches us, be Christ-like in the putting away of sin and ungodliness. If you've been saved six months, you ought to know more about the Lord now than you did six months ago. If you've been saved ten years, you ought to know more about the Lord, be more mature in the Lord now than you, you were even last year, but five years ago. Uh, I'll pull out outlines and I'll pull out messages and stuff I preached 15 years ago and t ten years ago and all that. And hopefully, I've matured in the Lord even since then. And, and you know, if I haven't, I've got to do some checking up. Uh, Brother Charlie Miller, I love Brother Charlie. He used to tell me, he said, 
Brother Doug, when you was an assistant pastor, you used to only preach 20 minutes. Now that you're a pastor, you preach 35, 40, 45. He'd be dying over this thing right here tonight. I said, how is that, Brother Doug? I said, Brother Charlie, I know more. He used to just love to aggravate. There's present sanctification. That's God working on. By the way, as long as you're breathing God's air, he, the Holy Spirit will be working on you, growing you and maturing you, and making you a better Christian. And then there's future sanctification. That's, hallelujah, what we're longing for. The day when we're resurrected out of this old body and we're given a body like Jesus and we'll be totally sanctified by that, in that day, we'll be just like Him. Now, sanctification is wrought by the Holy Spirit in our lives for one reason, that we may glorify God. Now, how can we do that? Well, we glorify God through being sanctified by the Holy Ghost of God in our works. In our works. We're not saved by works. But if you're saved, you'll have some works. James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. So, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We become the workmanship of Christ when we get saved. The Holy Ghost begins working in us that we will be the workmanship of Christ. But you will have good works showing what God's done in your life. Titus 3.8, this is a faithful saying of these things. I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So if the Lord is sanctifying you, making you spiritual, you'll have good works. What are the works of God in our life? Well, there's the work of discipline. You know why some people live cleaner than others? They've let the Holy Ghost of God discipline them. You know why secu in the secular world there are some people that are uh, better Athletes than others that are more gifted physically, they work harder. They're more disciplined. Hmm? You know why there are some people that are better at their job than other people working right next to them? They take more pride in it. They work harder at it. Hmm? You know why there are some people that are regimented to do things certain way? Because they work at it. They're disciplined. You know why there are some people who never get to church on time? I understand traffic. I understand coming from work and running late. But every service is a discipline problem. It is. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, this is what Paul said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I must myself should be a castaway. It's discipline. You know one of the worst things you can do is invite somebody to church and then you not show up and they show up and you not be here? You know how many times I've seen that? I've had people come in and say, where's so-and-so? They haven't called me and told me they're not coming, so I don't know. I don't know. They invited me. Hmm? The Holy Spirit will convict you about being more disciplined. But he's not going to make you be more disciplined. You've got to do the work. Hmm? Not only the works of discipline, the works of duty. There are some things that we need to do because they're right to do and they're taught in the Bible. Study in your Bible. The Holy Spirit will convict you to study your Bible but will not force you to study your Bible. Let me just qualify this. There's reading your Bible. You ought to read it every day. And listen, I'm not one of these guys who say you ought to read 20 chapters a day. I'd rather read one verse and get it down than read 20 chapters. But you ought to read your Bible every day. 
and then they're studying your Bible. There's a difference. When you study your Bible to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you study your Bible, you know when somebody's telling it to you straight when they're not. Used to have some folks here that questioned me on everything. Did. And so I just flat told them, when you've studied as much as I have, and you've prayed over as much as I have, and when you've lost as much sleep over as I have, then you can tell me what to do. Until then, keep your mouth shut. Didn't have any more problem out of that because they never studied their Bible. And I've always said, Brother Bob, if I say something that's not correct, if you'll show me in the Bible where I said something that wasn't correct, I'll gladly get up and recant it and tell everybody I'm sorry. I've yet to have anybody ever tell me that, too. But you've got to study your Bible. It's a duty. The Lord's not going to make you do it, but he'll bless you when you do it. Not only study your Bible, pray. The Holy Ghost will convict you to pray, but he's not going to force you to pray. And by the way, you can tell folks who do study their Bible, and you can tell folks who do pray. It shows out on them. Hmm? Uh, the duty of coming to church, being faithful. The Bible says, moreover, in stewards are required that a man be found faithful. We ought to be faithfully attending the church. Unless you're providentially hindered or sick, you ought to be in church, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. He's not going to force you to come. And I tell you what's hurt the church. It wasn't COVID. COVID didn't hurt the church. It's all the preachers that jumped on the live stream thing, and now they're whining and bellyaching because nobody comes to their church anymore. Because they can sit at home in their pajamas, drink their coffee, and watch live stream. I don't care who you are. Live stream's not like being here. Well, when I had COVID and had to miss those 10 days or 14 days or whatever it was, Randy hated it. Because I'd be texting him, hey, the sound's off here. Hey, the camera angle's off here. Hey, he, he finally turned his phone off. He got tired of hearing me. He was driving me crazy watching it. The duty of tithing. Tithing's a faith thing. I've learned I can't live without it. God does a, a whole lot better with 90% then I can do with 100%. And that's if you give 10%. But there's tithing, and then there's an offering on top of the tithe, the mission on the whole deal. It's a duty. It's a works. Works of discipline. Works of duty. You say, I'm doing good in some of those areas. Wonderful. Ask the Lord to help you in the other areas. And then there's the duty, or the work of discernment. This is the hardest thing in the world try and teach people because either you got it or you don't I can't teach it to you you know it's like hitting a 90 mile an hour fastball can't, I can give you all the mechanics but if you don't have the hand eye coordination you're never going to hit it same thing with discernment I can't give you the magic wand of discernment only the Holy Ghost can teach you discernment if you don't pray and study and seek God's face, you'll never have it. And again, it shows out on you whether you do or don't. People know if you're spiritual and if you're not. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 says, Now we have, received not, uh, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but by the Holy Ghost, uh, by which the Holy Ghost teaches, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Let me say this right now. Lost man cannot be spiritually discerned. But a carnal Christian is not spiritually discerned. If you got all them conduct issues we talked about earlier, you're not going to be spiritual. Hmm? It goes on to say this. Uh, uh, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You can be spiritual. If you learn to yield yourself to the Spirit of God, learn to listen to that still small voice. Learn the work of spiritual discernment. Sanctification deals with works. 
deals with our witness. Acts 1.8, the Lord told him, last thing before he goes up, he said, uh, uh, when the Spirit of God comes, you'll be witnesses unto me in Samaria, Ju Judea, uh, Jerusalem, the uttermost parts of the world. The Spirit of God makes you an effective witness. If you don't have the Spirit of God leading and directing you, you will not be a good witness. The Spirit of God is what gives you boldness to tell somebody about the Lord. That fear and apprehension is when you're not trusting in God. The last thing sanctification will do. It will teach you to worship. There are some people that don't know anything about worship. Come to church for years. Never see them shed a tear. Never see them raise their hand. Never hear them say amen. Never see them shout. Never ever see them on the altar. Never see any change out of them. They're a bump on the pew every service. Thank God they're here. But they don't worship. Because they haven't been sanctified by the Spirit of God. They're too busy with worldly things than spiritual things. And it shows out on them. John chapter 4 verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We'll close with this little, little thought here. Some of you get real upset when, mainly me, but then every preacher that I, come, I have come, you think I put a bug in their ear. I never tell them what to preach, never tell them what I've preached, never tell them. It amazes me how many preachers come, and some of them use the very same vernacular that I use. You say, how's that happen? We know the same God. But you get all upset when a preacher preaches on Facebook or your computer or your TV watching or your movie going or whatever else hobby you have. Now listen, I'm no fool. We're in this world. We're not of this world, but we're in this world. And living in this world, you face pressures and problems and stresses and all kinds of things and sometimes you need a release now a release is not taking a ball bat and beating up your neighbor's cat might feel like it but that's not a good deal that's going to blow your conduct and your witness right there okay in everything there's blessing and cursing if at the end of your day you want to take a few minutes and watch funny cat videos on Facebook to just unwind, that's one thing. If you want to, you know, just relax, I personally recommend some Daniel Waters music or, or any of uh, wonderful gospel music. And I, I like listening to music of people that I've met because I know their testimony. And they bless me. Uh, but if, hey, if you want to throw in on a rough day, the Eagles take it easy. That's one thing. But if you like Randy and you want to throw in some lead for the head, some lead Zeppelin, and listen to it for about six hours, you're going to have a problem. You will go beat up your neighbor's cat and then bite the head off of his dog, okay? It's a problem when you can't lay it down. Then it's an addiction. And in 1 Corinthians 16, it tells us we're to be addicted to the ministry of the saints. If you spend four, five, six, seven hours a day with something, it's a problem. Or if your intent is to get on Facebook so you can find out everything about everybody else, you've got a problem. That means you're not satisfied with your own life, and you're not satisfied with your own life because you're not putting God first. It's one thing to get a release from something. It's another thing to be controlled by something. And the Spirit of God cannot sanctify you when you do not give Him first place in your life. And the reason you can't come to the house of God and worship is because you haven't been worshiping all week long. 
you haven't been spending time with him all week long. He said, Brother Doug, there's no time. We heard Miss Kathy testify tonight how she learned to turn off the radio and just start talking to God just to and fro work and how it's impacted her in the last week abundantly. It'll impact you too, friend. I learned a long time ago, quantity isn't always the best with God. Quality is the best with God. And you've heard it sung, little is much when God's in it. Are you listening? God's not asking you to get from here to there overnight. He's just asking for a little bit of time here, a little bit of time there, a little space of grace here, a little space. And you'd be amazed at what God will do in your life. Too many try to be spiritual or to become sanctified by following their list of rules. You can't do it. It's always a work of the Holy Spirit. Now the bottom line is, will we let him work in our lives? Will we lay our Isaacs down and confess to God, God, it's me? God, help me in this area of separation to be pleasing unto you. And then, God, in this area of sanctification, God, you do for me what I can't do for myself. Be willing to throw up a white flag and say, Here, God, here's my life. Whatever pleases you, help me, Lord, to be involved in it. Romans chapter 12 is not in my notes, but it just came to my mind. I'm going to read it to you because this is where we're going to end, right here. Because this right here just says it all. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Tonight, are you willing to present yourself to God, a living sacrifice? Here I am, Lord. Lord impact me so much that it impacts others there's been times I've walked down the, down the shopping center walk and people stop me and say you're a Christian aren't you now to an indictment against me that doesn't happen every day but people ought to know people ought to see a difference and when we come to worship you ought to see a difference in him. When he begins to sanctify you, you will. You wonder why some people around here get so excited? They've just seen him. They've heard his voice in a song. They've seen him move in somebody else's life. It touches them. I wonder tonight, are you willing to present yourself a living sacrifice? Lord, show me areas of my life where I need to separate. Lord, sanctify me in those areas that you're not pleased with. Help me, Lord, to truly be Christ-like. Let's all stand, Brother Clayton, and come get a song. Let's pray. Father, thank you for... Is a lot of heavy things in there, Lord. A lot of things our flesh don't like but all necessary if we're truly going to be Christ-like. Lord, help us not to look to the right or left of us, but help us to look to you, and then, God, you show us, Lord, where we lack in our lives. And then, God, help us, give us grace. Present ourselves a living sacrifice to be the vessel that pleases you. Have your way in this invitation now. God, if there's somebody here not saved, I pray tonight they'd come give their heart and life to Jesus. Folks that are saved, God, bless them. Help them to live a separated, sanctified life that glorifies God. That bring attention to them, but just glorifies God that others will come to know you. Bless now this invitation. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.